Guys, I need you to pay attention to this. When you say that you need help because you've fallen off the wagon, you have to realize one thing. It is impossible to fall off the wagon. You're the one driving. You can't fall out of something unless you specifically get out. You don't plan and put your seatbelt on. You're in control. So if you fall out of the wagon, if you fall off the path, whatever it is, no. You went off the path. You drove off the path. You did something that didn't prepare for that hole in the road that you saw five miles away and you ran into the hole. You are in control. You're in the driver's seat. Don't blame it on circumstances. Hi there and welcome to another success story. And I am so excited to have Coach Bronson. Hi. Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me. Uh, it's it's a pleasure. I've been dying to get you on. So I'm going to dive straight in with a question ask absolutely everybody. So Bronson, why did you become carnivore? Um, mostly because I wanted to see if cutting out plants would fix or make me feel better. Uh, I had chronic IBS, I had urgent bowels, I had a lot of issues with the digestive system. And it was kind of just a curiosity. I heard about it. Let's see what happens if, it, you know, if I do this kind of thinking of it as an elimination diet, not expecting at all that almost five years later, I would still be doing it because of all the additional benefits and things that, that I got out of it. So it started out as an experiment to see if my gut health would improve, um, my digestion, all that stuff was gone. Within 90 days, that stuff was gone. It was very impactful. Uh, the amount of stress and anxiety that I realized uh, I was having in my life because of the gut issues really it's just amazing how when that stuff goes away, you have a whole new life. It's like the impact of the food and how it affects our body going into the stress and anxiety of just your day-to-day -day activities and always worried about where's the bathroom and I got to go before I leave on my trip. When, you know, the process of going on our trip was a process of going to the bathroom like six times before I could even get on the plane, just in case I got stuck in a line or couldn't find a bathroom or who knows what. Um, just all of the kind of stuff. So that level of anxiety completely going away, turning into the realization that not only did my digestion get better, but my energy improved, my body composition improved, the inflammation in my body. So the pain that I was feeling from working out uh, went away. I recovered from my workouts faster. My performance started getting better because I was recovering faster. I could do more work. My volume increased in the gym. So I went from three days a week to five or six days a week. And I felt great the entire time. Whereas before three days a week, I felt like I got hit by a truck every day. So there's just so many additional in things that impacted um, not just my health, but my quality of life that just cutting out vegetables. It's just crazy how that one change was so impactful. So what was you eating? Was you eating a particular style of food? You know, was it the Mediterranean diet or was you just standard American diet? With yeah, no, I was. And that's the thing is I was about as healthy. If you had looked at my diet prior to carnivore, anybody that looked at how I ate would have said it was the healthy, one of the healthiest diets they could, they could have put together themselves, right? It was mostly paleo, didn't eat processed food, didn't eat sugar. Um, I went through a phase actually where I stopped drinking alcohol. So, I mean, I ate mostly meat and vegetables. Uh, the amount of meat was not nearly as much as it is now. And the amount of vegetables, obviously way more than, than it is now. Um, but it was all whole food. I was a one ingredient kind of, kind of guy. I didn't do a lot of ice cream. I didn't do a lot of pizza, which I had in the past. When I first got started on my journey, I didn't get really started in this whole journey until my mid, uh, eh, not even mid, late 30s. I was almost 40 years old when I started figuring this stuff out. And uh, I was a pizza, pad thai, ice cream, coffee with sugar, Boston cream, and French fry guy. Those were the things I ate almost every single day. It wasn't like I'll have ice cream this week. It was like, which night am I not going to have ice cream? Kind of a thing. Which night am I not going to have my, or which morning on my way to work am I not going to have my coffee with three scoops of sugar, my two Boston cream donuts, and I had to get the egg egg mini wrap because that was the healthy option, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so that was that was my lifestyle, and it took years to get to the point where, you know, being a single ingredient whole foods kind of nutrition uh, plan that I was on, 
And I had a lot of success and a lot of changes, but again, still had the urgent bowels, still had the IBS, still had the inflammation and the other things that were going on. And it wasn't until I cut plants out completely that all that stuff went away. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of questions there, but I won't get into all of it. I, I want to actually ask then, when did you first get into fitness then? Forget yeah. the nutrition. Yeah, that was first. And that was my journey started on the fitness side. I, uh, for, for my 40th birthday, I went on a cruise and it was a router. It was probably a year or two before that where I'd been faced with this uh, picture of myself um, physically that did not represent the image that I have of myself. So the reality of who I thought I was and how I presented myself and everything conf was confronted with the, re the reality of you're a fat slob who's out of shape and you're not healthy and you need to fix this. Uh, and so those two things coming to a head in my late thirties, I started looking into how do I get in shape? How do I fix this? And for me, that was mostly a physical thing. It was more about fitness, getting in shape. Um, and so I went on a cruise for my 40th birthday. I saw this guy working out in the workout room while I was on the treadmill or the elliptical, I forget what it was. And he's over there throwing dumbbells around, doing all this stuff. And I'm like, what in the world is that guy doing? So ended up like either that day or the next day. It's one of those times in the gym. I, you know, started talking to him, asking him what he's doing. He introduced me to CrossFit and started, we did some stuff. He showed me some things. Turns out he owned a CrossFit gym in Florida at the time. So we, you know, I did some workouts with him. He was really cool about teaching me some things and introducing me to the concepts. And so when I got home, I was like, I got to figure, I got to find a gym. I got to do this. It was amazing. So I found a gym, started doing things, fell in love with the, not even just the exercise and the workouts in the community, because that's all great, but fell in love with the education and the exposure to a, an understanding of what fitness is about that I'd never been exposed to before an understanding that fitness is about improving how your body functions more than it is improving how your body looks. And that paradigm shift for me made all the difference because here I am going into my forties, trying to figure out how am I going to do this, keep up with all these young kids in here who are crushing it. And then realizing that I don't need to, I'm here for me. I'm here trying to figure out how I can make myself better and just make my body work better. And that's a whole different level of uh, mental focus when it's about just trying to improve what your body can do. There's less stress. There's less anxiety. It's not about how you look. You're not stressed over this, this one single metric of, I need to lose weight. I need to get skinny. It actually opens up a door that we can look at the 30 or 40 different things that you can measure when it comes to physical performance. Now I'm looking at how much muscle do I have? instead of just worrying about losing weight. Now I'm looking at how well can I move my body without getting injured? Now I'm looking at, am I getting stronger? Am I getting faster? Am I processing fuel better? Is, the, am I able to work in different time domains and things like that? So it, it just opened up a whole different aspect for me of what fitness was and got me to start thinking about my quality of life and what I was actually trying to do with fitness versus just I'm going to the gym so I can lose. And when you started the fitness journey, mm -hmm. did you underestimate the power of nutrition at that point for a long period of time? Yeah. I mean, I knew there were some things I needed to change and it took me a year. So the first thing I did on the nutrition side, which is why I say it was mostly fitness, because I did a lot on the fitness side the first couple of years. Um, the nutrition side, it took me about a year to get to the point where I stopped eating French fries. That was my first, my first hurdle and benchmark was no more French fries. So, you know, I went through that phase of, okay, I, I'm not even going to go out to eat because I know if I go out to eat, I'm going to get French fries. So I'm going to stop going out to eat. I'm going to eat at home. That was the biggest one. Then it got to the point where I could go out to eat and I would just ask for the food without the fries. Right. And then there were times where sometimes they, the, the server would get it mixed up and there it would come with fries. And in that, in that period, I'd probably eat most of the fries, right? Because I wasn't at that point yet. Um, but then slowly, slowly, that kind of got over time to where it was, you know, just I can go out to eat now and I don't even really think about the fries, right? I think about the food that I'm about to have and how much I'm going to enjoy it. Food enjoyment on carnivore is severely underrated, severely underrated. A lot of people going into it think, if I'm just going to eat meat, I'm going to be bored. 
if you're providing yourself with nutrition and you're eating enough, that's one thing, eating enough. If you're getting good, healthy meat with fat and you're, you're, you're cooking it well, you can use seasonings, like whatever you want to do. There are so many different meat options, ways that you can cook it, ways that you can prepare it. Um, I've been doing this for five years and I have never, not one single time, have I ever looked at my plate and went, ugh, this again? It's like, no, every time I'm, I'm getting ready to eat, I'm, I'm, I'm like, give me food, give me more, I want more. Yeah, that's, that's really good. I, I, I'm the same, actually. And I was only thinking that today. Just, wow, <laughs> I'm never bored. Uh, yep. I'm a little bit behind you. I think mine's three and a half years now. So okay. um, I, I changed to 55. So I've got a 58 and a half and well, still loving it. Still loving it. Yep. So the question I'd love to know then is what was the penny dropping moment when you thought, right, five years ago, you thought to yourself, right, I'm going to try carnivore. Was it an influencer in particular? How did you come to that? Conclusion? Yeah, no, it was introduced to me. Um, and the it was the uh, Joe Rogan, Sean Baker podcast. So that was I, I got that sent to me and took a look, took a listen to it. Um, it was, I don't even remember exactly when that was, but I saw it like the last week of, of April, 2018. Uh, and then I just decided, all right, I did a little research, tried to find some stuff I could find. There wasn't much out at the time. There was a couple of Facebook groups. There might've been, um, a wiki or not a wiki, like a blog or two out there. And I just decided, all right, this looks like there's, I mean, it's me. It can't be that bad. Um, I, I never was concerned initially about the whole cholesterol thing or any that kind of stuff it was for me it was the questions were more about don't you need plants to get nutrition so that was more of my question so once I started looking into some things realizing well maybe we don't and maybe if I'm not eating plant you know started answering some of those questions initially um, so then I just decided to try it May 1st 2018 and went cold turkey I, whatever meat we had in the fridge, I started eating that. When it ran out, I went and got more and I had the access. And was you surprised? I mean, was it a quick turnaround? Yeah, it was one of those things where it probably happened. It happened, I would say it, the changes in my body and how things were going probably happened sooner than I recognized because I had been such a routine of particularly when it came to my digestion, urgent bowels and IBS, particularly when it came to that, it was pro it was about two and a half, three months in when I realized, hey, wait, I don't need to go to the bathroom. Hey, I don't need, you know, we're getting ready to go somewhere. I cannot have to worry about going to the bathroom before I get in the car. When we get there, I don't have to go to the bathroom right when we get there. We, you know, before we leave, I don't have to, you know, all these things started clicking like, I'm not having these urges, even when I do go, nothing's happening. So I'm like, well, I'm spending time that I don't need to spend trying to do something that's not a problem anymore. So that that probably was maybe a month or less, but it was about three months before I started realizing. And then on the fitness side, um, it was about three to four months when things started going crazy. I started, the biggest thing I noticed on the fitness side, two things. One, I had chronic injuries. I was an injury I was a ball of injuries in my, in my, in my mid forties. So I had, uh, in my late thirties, I had herniated discs, degenerative discs in my neck. I have rotator, rotator cuffs, uh, slap tears in both shoulders. I have a meniscus tear in my left knee. I had multiple pulled hamstrings, pulled adductors and groin, torn calves. Like this is all stuff that happened in my, um, early 40s to mid 40s. And everyone is like, well, that's because you're doing CrossFit, you're going to get hurt. Well, guess what? The five years since I went carnivore, still doing CrossFit, all of those injuries have healed. And I have not had a single injury since. So when you look at the nutrition, the impact that reducing the inflammation we put into our body allows our body to function better, allows us to recover better and help prevent injury because now we're our body's doing the things and growing and repairing and recovering like it's supposed to, we can say, hey, maybe nutrition has a link to the aches and the pains and the recovery and injuries. And all those other things. Yes. And I think that's one of the biggest things I found. Um, I'm a lower back, special, lower back specialist here in the UK. And um, I got into that because in my 20s, when I was 23, I did a bodybuilding tournament. Mm. Yep. 
I know I'm not massive now, but um, <laughs> I was I was I was a bit more interested in it then. It was totally a natural show, but I was told I'd be in a wheelchair by the time I was fifty. So I'm oh, fifty eight, yeah. and uh, but it, I had a back injury, but um, you know you can get over these things as you've proved. Sure. And I do want to go back to your training, but just quickly because there'll be so many people watching or listening that will be saying, okay, well. What's his meal frequency? What's he doing? So how often are you eating a day? And um, what about your macros? Yeah, so I actually have just, uh, the last couple of days, I've been coming off a three-week lion diet experiment. So my normal, we'll talk about what I normally do outside of that. Uh, while I was doing that, it was pretty much two pounds of meat a day, and that was it. Uh, what I'm doing, what I'm going back into, my base macros, because it changes. So looking at my base meal, uh, my base meal is one and a half to two pounds of ground beef, uh, about 88% lean, and 10 to 12 eggs. That's my base food for the day. And um, and two meal, two meals a day. So a pound, a a, 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 yeah, three quarters to a, a three quarters of a pound to a pound, and four to six eggs twice a day. Brilliant. So nice and simple. Yep. It is, isn't and, it? And what delicious. And delicious, yes, <laughs> and and actually easy to cook. I mean, that's one of the yeah. things. There's very little prep. What about fasting? Do you incorporate any sort of fasting? Not on like purpose. extended fasting. No, no. For for me and for the people that I that I work with, and in a lot of cases, um, fasting is is a great tool for fat loss. And we often, I think, fasting is far overhyped because there's a lot of people in the space who have made their careers off of the idea of fasting. Um, I think the benefits of fasting are great and they do exist. There isn't a single benefit of fasting that is not also achieved through exercise, number one. Number two, when you exercise, you get the added bonus of actually improving your work capacity and the function of your physiology, right? So fasting is great for the biological benefits that it has. Exercise is great for the same biological benefits, but it also improves the physiological aspect of their lives. So for me, um, fasting happens naturally. I eat two meals a day. Most of those most of those meals just happen to be in a six to eight hour window. I don't do that on purpose. I get up when I eat, when I get hungry, and then I eat again later before I get super hungry again. So that's just kind of how that works. Um, last night, here is a perfect example. Last night, I had two meals. I had my first meal around uh, 10.30 in the morning, which is normal. I usually eat between 10.30 and 11.30. Then my second meal is usually between 4.30 and 5.30, sometimes 6, depends on schedule and the gym, things like that. So I usually eat again at the latest 6 o'clock in the evening, and then I'm done for the night. That's just kind of how I do it. Last night at 11.45 at night, I came out and I looked at my girlfriend and I was like, I'm hungry. And she looked at me and she's like, really? Are you sure you're not just bored? Because we have this thing, right? People, a lot of times you get up late, you're doing stuff, you get, you know, you're late, you're, you got stuff going on and you want to snack. And I was like, no, this isn't snackiness. This is, I'm hungry. And I made like a pound of meat and ate, and ate it like it was nothing. Like it was like, it was so good. And I slept like a baby afterwards. It's like, so there are times where, you know what? If you need it, you need it. If you don't, you don't. And just kind of go with that. Yeah, great answers, Bronson. I'm really enjoying this. So uh, there's going to be a few other questions, then we'll get a <laughs> bit more in depth. But people ask these. I get them in the comments. Yeah. So do you bother measuring your glucose, your ketones, those sort of nope. things? Great. Not at all. Not at all. Perfect yeah, answer. Ketone, yeah, I don't. I, 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 I had a CGM. I tried the CGM thing for a couple of weeks. Um, and I realized I was fixated on the CGM instead of just living my life. It's like, you know what, this is, I don't want this. I, this is annoying. It's not going to make a difference in what I'm doing anyway, so who cares? Uh, number one. Number two, when we talk about measuring ketones, um, this is one thing that I'm very um, interested in helping people understand. Ketosis, number one, is not the goal. Number two, too many people who should know better in this space use the word ketosis improperly. Ketosis is not ketogenic. Ketosis simply means, it means nothing more than high levels of ketone in the blood. That's it. That's all it means. I could eat a pint of ice cream and then drink a ketone drink 
test my ketones and I would technically be in ketosis. It means absolutely nothing about the metabolic state or the function of my metabolism and its ability to process and create its own ketones or glycogen. So we need to understand that testing your ketones and having high ketones is really synonymous and parallel to the same issues with glucose. High glucose is excess fuel in the blood that your body's not using. High ketones is excess fuel in the blood that your body's not using. If it's, you're not using it, why do you want it? That's kind of how I look at it. Mm, that's a really good, uh, really good um, way of looking at it. I like that. I might be stealing that from you when I talk <laughs> to my coaching clients. No, it's very good. Um, yes, I, I'm not into all that tracking in case you're interested. I, yeah. I, I've done it for experiments because uh, in May of last year, I did an experiment where I gained weight deliberately and then mm. lost it just oh. to show. Uh, I've been thinking about doing that. I just, I don't know if mentally if I could. If I can deal with that, the whole well, fat proved, to fit to fat thing or whatever. Yeah, I'm not doing it. I, I, I'm, I'm doing it one more time and that's it because it's just a proof concept because a lot right. of clients will say, well, at my age, I, I can't lose the weight. It's time. And I'll say, I'm older than you. Come on. You know, so I thought I would have it all videoed and recorded and I did 18 weeks of live streams to show that you can put on weight very easily but you can take it off but it's not easy but it's simple there's a big difference yeah. in me yeah, yeah. um and I deliberately did it without exercise uh, which which really really hurt really I did not enjoy yes. not doing that um which is my little segue into training so sure. obviously you mentioned that you do crossfit um mm -hmm. do you recommend that to all your clients or is that just your thing you not know. crossfit but crossfit so here, here's the here's the thing the uh, what most people think crossfit is is not what crossfit is most people think crossfit and they think what they see of these jacked animals on espn doing all this stuff that's what they think crossfit is that is the equivalent to the nfl versus backyard football with your kids that is that that's what it is CrossFit for the normal average everyday person going to their CrossFit box in their neighborhood is a completely different experience and a completely different thing. Um, the methodologies and the concepts behind CrossFit, there's three things that every coach who goes to their first, the day one training for CrossFit coaches, the first thing that they teach is technique, perform consistently before you increase intensity. That's the, that's the tenet. That's the basic first concept that, that is taught in CrossFit. So understanding that the definition of CrossFit and what CrossFit is about is about improving your body's capacity to do work. And work can be defined by each individual person. Some people improving their body's ability to, to do work is improving their ability to walk up and down the stairs, garden in their backyard, and play with their grandkids. If they improve their physiology, if they improve their strength and all the different aspects of fitness, then they can improve the quality of their life by increasing, and this is the key, increasing their physical freedom. That's what CrossFit is about. So when I talk about everyone should do CrossFit or I think everyone should do CrossFit, what I'm saying is the methodologies and the concepts behind what fitness is for. Fitness, what we do in the gym is not about what we do in the gym. It's about how we improve our lives outside of the gym. and so it, from that perspective, yes, everyone should do CrossFit. Everybody should find what works for them in a way that's going to help them improve as many aspects of fitness as they possibly can. What are your views on people that tend to overtrain? What, um, why do you think that happens? That happens because they're not understanding what training actually is. And their goals are not deep enough. So I, I, I talk about the why a lot. Why are you doing this? And People who overtrain are trying to reach a superficial goal. They think that if they lose weight, if they do something to change how their body looks, if they can get to a certain size, whatever it may be, and they just work hard enough, they're going to get to that. And if you really dig down into why you're doing something, there's a, there's a, a, a process that I use with my clients called the seven levels of why. And I help them work through the real reason behind, let's say your goal is, I want to lose weight. Why do you want to lose weight? Well, I want to lose weight because I don't feel confident in the weight that I'm at. Well, why don't you feel confident in the weight you're at, regardless of your weight? 
well, because I was brought up with thinking that like, and you can work yourself all the way down into something that is really deep rooted in your psyche, in your limiting beliefs, in your perception of the world, in your identity, something that is emotional to why you want to make a change. If you can do that, you'll realize that that emotional connection to why you're really trying to do what you're doing has nothing to do with the amount of work that you did. It has everything to do with you dealing with that thing and understanding how you can use fitness and nutrition to accomplish that change in your life or reestablish a new identity or whatever it is. So I think that's the biggest thing. People that overtrain haven't really connected with the deep rooted reason why they're trying to training in the first place. And they just think if I work hard enough, I'll get somewhere. And then what happens is two things happen. They either get there and then realize, well, that's not what I expected it to be. Now I got to do something else because they, it's not the right why. Or they hurt themselves on the way, then they get discouraged and fall off completely because they overtrain and they have a chronic issue and now they can't train at all. And now they think they just give up. And I think this is one of the things that shines through in all these interviews is the why that makes you cry is actually the thing. That oh, matters. I love that. I'm stealing that from you. <laughs> oh my gosh, oh. that is amazing. How have I never heard that before? <laughs> well, you've not come to you to England, have you? Um, oh my goodness, yes. Yes. And it's so obvious when you hear it, isn't it? But yes. I mean, we pick up all these things. Um, no, that is that is fantastic. Cause I because I usually say, like, you'll know when you got to that why, when you have an emotional reaction, when you feel sad, happy, glad, upset, frustrated. Uh, have regret about something, get happy, get hopeful. There's some kind of emotion that has to be connected. Mm. Because here's the thing, the habits and the triggers that we have are all emotional. So we have an emotion that, that we have a habit loop of reaction, whether it be food, relationships, communication, whatever it is. If we don't have a new emotion to attach a new reaction to, then the old emotion is always going to win. And mm. if it's just a mind, like I'm it's willpower. I have to just mind over matter. That is not sustainable. It is not going to work. Period. It has to be emotional. And I think all the good decisions you make are emotional and all bad ones, actually. You make bad decisions when you're highly um, strung. Um, one last question, and then I want to get into hormones, but it's, uh, it's, it's fashionable at the moment. So what are your views on, <laughs> what are your views on fruit? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, here's the deal, folks. And this goes for any nutrition question. It, can I do it? Should I do it? Is it good? Is it bad? Um, number one, there are no rules. There's no rule book. There's no police. No one's knocking on your door. No one's watching you to see what you eat. You're the only person that has any control over what you put in your mouth. So you are the only person who gets to decide whether you put something in your mouth. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the only criteria for whether you decide you want to put something in your mouth or not is, is this going to help me or is this going to hurt me? And which choice do I want to make today? That's it. It's not good. It's not bad. It's how does this affect my ability to reach my goal? And do I want to take a step back, stay where I am or move forward? That is all it is. So I do not have a personal take when it comes to what people should do with fruit because it is a completely subjective decision. Do you eat fruit? No. No. Personally, I, I do not. No, personally, I don't actually. I used to love it. <laughs> I mean, I, I did the healthy diet, you know, the high sure. carb, no sure. fat. Sure. And, and, and that's stuff. where we get into the educated, you know, the educated decisions. So we can talk about what happens when we eat fruit and then let someone make up their mind. There's a mm. difference. I would rather have someone eat an orange than drink orange juice because now we talk about nuance and applicability and context. So if, you, if you're going to ask me, should I have orange juice? I'm going to say, here's what happens with orange juice. It's probably not as good for you as if you ate an orange. If you had to choose between the two, I would recommend eating the orange as far as what it's going to do to your body and what's going to be more or less harmful. If you want to say, do I want an orange versus nothing? then I would say nothing is going to do this or not do this in that case, because it's an absence of any stimulus. Or if you eat the orange, here's some other things that you may consider that could happen to you. Your choice. That's a great answer, Bronson, actually. Um, I want to get onto the training. Sure. Because one of the things I encounter as a personal trainer, I'm 
I have quite a broad range of qualifications. Um, one of the questions I get asked is, you told me fasting is a stressor, so I need to be careful of fasting. But you also say that workouts are a sure. stressor. Yeah. What's the difference? Everything's, everything's a stressor. <laughs> Seriously. I'm, I'm on this kick right now, and I'm actually thinking about getting some formal training in stress management because something clicked with me uh, several months ago where I, I just may, had this epiphany that everything in life is stress management. Every single aspect of our life, neurolog neurologically, biologically, physiologically, emotionally, mentally, everything is a stressor. We are either preparing for stress, dealing with stress, or recovering from stress. We're always somewhere in that general, somewhere in that general adaptation syndrome. We're 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 in it 100 percent of the time. So understanding that everything is stress, now we have an option. Do I want to manage my stress and prepare for it as much as possible, or do I want to just be reactive and take whatever life throws at me? And that's where we now we can talk about acute stress, chronic stress, hormetic stress, and all the other different types of stresses and where they're coming from. And fasting is a stressor, but so is eating. What, what, what's the difference? We need both. We need a period of time where we're not eating because our body has time to process and recover. But we also have a, a time where we need to break that down and we need to fall and do those processes of breaking down food and distributing nutrition to our body. So. To say that one is better than the other, if you're talking about, again, and this is the context that, that I love going back to, if we're talking about fat loss, then fasting is a great hormetic stress. If we're talking about optimal function of all three, all three systems of the body, neuro neurology, biology, and physiology, then I would choose exercise over fasting because exercise is a controlled stress that I can apply that's going to impact a broader range of things in my body than fasting would. Yes. One of the examples I use is, is the mental state of somebody because I'll say, now imagine someone's not eating for a day, not out of choice. They have no money. They are actually starving. And you pick to do 24-hour fasting. Do you not think the body physiology is different in the person that hasn't got the money to eat compared to you who's choosing. It's just that control that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And they get that straight away because they know that that person that's starving is physiologically in a very complete world of stress and worry. Yeah. There's a whole whereas, different level of things. Yeah. yeah. Whereas you've got food in the fridge and you've got some money to go and buy some and it just makes a big difference. And that's yeah. my very poor segue to get into hormones <laughs> because <laughs> I think one of the other things when we start talking about working out with clients is um, with guys in particular about testosterone, mm -hmm. women in particular worried about the, the thyroid hormones as they get older. So do you have any particular yeah. views on that, that area? Yeah. Lift weights, eat protein, get sleep. That, that's, that's the answer for 99% of the people, unless you actually have a thyroid dysfunction or something wrong with your thyroid. Um, or there's for some reason you're not making hormones properly. Uh, that's the that's the, the 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 bottom line minimum thing that we need to do, and that's that's where people get mixed up when it comes to hormones. People tend to overtrain, not get good sleep, no stress management, um, and then they're overworked. Women in particular, I, most of my clientele are women. I deal probably ninety percent of the, my clientele are women. Over um, I worked with them for the past 10 plus years. And the number one thing that I see is overtraining because they're trying to get skinny, not trying to fix their metabolic function, which is a completely different paradigm. They mentally, they're always trying to do things for other people, not for themselves. They feel guilty when they try to take time for themselves. So they tend to not do that. They stress, they have anxiety, they don't sleep. And there's just so many things. And then they, because they're focused on that weight loss and getting skinny many times, they're under eating. So they're not getting enough protein. They're not getting enough fat. They're malnourished. So when you add all of this stuff, all of this stuff together, you just get yourself into a whole mix of witch's stew of reasons why your thyroid's not working. And then what happens is, and this is where the mistake when it comes to the keto carnivore space comes in, is they take those same paradigms and then they just, 
go keto with it. And then they say, well, keto didn't work for me. Well, no, you didn't change anything about your life. You just changed the food you were eating. You're still overtraining. You're still under eating. You're still overstressed. You're still not getting sleep. You're not doing weight training. You're on the elliptical for 45 minutes to two hours a day. You're trying to get 50,000 steps. I had a client come to me once. Literally, her goal every day was to get 40 to 50,000 steps. And it's like, that is why. Like, what are you doing to yourself? She didn't get a two to two and a half hour walk a day. She felt like she wasn't doing anything for her health. I'm like, you're actually going the opposite direction. You're making yourself less healthy. You know, so trying to break all of that stuff is really the, the challenge that I have as a coach is to make people understand that doing more does not mean getting better. Less is more in many cases. Absolutely. In yes. recovery, I have that with clients. I have to not put a rest day into their diary. I have to write recovery day or mm. programmed recovery day, and then they feel yes. better. That they're not resting or being lazy this is crazy so how do you get your clients how do they get in contact with you um all over the place i have my website is ultimate ketogenic fitness and that is my brand so you you know anybody that googles ultimate ketogenic fitness will find my youtube channel my website my book all of this it's been brilliant having you actually and just for oh, the people fantastic i love it yeah that's great just for the people listening uh on the podcast or anyone that's watching the video if you've really enjoyed that, then I recommend you watch this video next because that's going to continue your health journey.